In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now this takes me back a long ways now, 17 years. When I was first asked to tell my story, though, right after coming into the Catholic Church, I remember I wandered back into my office at home, and I sat down at the desk, and I just stared out the window into the backyard, and I was thinking, where do I begin? What do I include? What do I say? I picked up a book that you may have seen before. It's called um, Surprised by Truth. It's a book in which 11 converts to the Catholic faith tell their story and give their reasons. The book was on my desk. I picked it up, and I flipped open to the prologue, and I just, my eyes fell on the first paragraph, and this is what I read. Conversion is a form of martyrdom. It involves the surrender of oneself, body, mind, intellect, and faith to Christ. It requires docility and a willingness to be led to the truth. And for many, the truth lies in a direction where you do not want to go. I had to laugh looking at that. For many, the truth lies in a direction where you do not want to go. And I have to say, this was certainly the case for me, even more so for my poor wife, Tina, I had no conception, she had no conception of becoming Catholic. Quite literally, the thought had never once crossed my mind in my entire life to think about Catholicism or to become a Catholic. In fact, after becoming a Catholic for the longest time, I would wake up in the morning and then just suddenly remember, I'd go, oh Lord, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> it's like I'd been transported to another planet or something, and you, know, you wake up and go, Oh yeah, I live on Venus. Oh yeah. Don't want you to get me wrong. Of course, the Catholic faith has become to me something very, very beautiful. And as I look back, well, it was something that was purchased at some cost in my life and in the life of my family. As I look back, as I look forward, as I look at my five little grandchildren, when they come in here, you know, to morning mass, you know, during the week, I, uh, something that would not be, except for the fact that our family became Catholic. And now my daughter Blythe and her husband Kirby have established a wonderful Catholic family. And I thank God from the bottom of my heart for the mercy that God showed me in leading me into the Catholic faith. But I want to go back to the beginning and tell you the whole story tonight. I hope, I hope it's an interesting story to you. I was not raised in a Christian family of any kind in, in my early years. My mother had been baptized as a Methodist when she was 14 years old. My dad had been raised in a very devout and very fundamentalist Baptist church. In fact, his father was a, a Baptist minister, farmer during the week, Baptist minister on the weekend. But they had both wandered from their faith. We had a, a large family Bible in our home. I don't remember anybody ever cracking it, anybody ever reading it. Um, it wasn't a Christian home. In fact, my parents were divorced when I was very young, um, probably seven or eight years old. I'm not sure. I, I found out many years later that my dad had, and was actually married five times. My, my mother was my, was my dad's fourth wife. I didn't know that until I was basically grown. Um, it was a tough situation. My mother was very angry, very hurt. Um, she wanted us to hate our dad, you know. There was, there was a lot of strange pressure, psychological torment really in the family. But my dad lived close by and he looked, seemed like a nice guy to me. He came by on Saturdays to mow the lawn and to visit. And when we were, when I, when I was about 10 years old, my dad suddenly decided his kids needed to be in church. <laughs> and uh, he started coming by on a Sunday morning and picking up my sister, my brother and I, and hauling us down to the local Baptist church in Riverside, California, Grace Baptist Church. He would plop us down in the pew, literally, and he would go outside and stand in the parking lot and smoke cigars and sort of listen through the back door. Uh, he wanted us in church because, because of his upbringing, he knew deep down inside the truth of Christ, but he wasn't living it himself. Um, thing is, you know, God has strange ways, and uh, while my dad was standing at the back door smoking his cigars and listening to the sermons, God called him. And uh, 46 years old, he, he, he came into the church and he walked forward down the aisle and gave his life to Christ again. And his conversion was real, it was sincere. Uh, my dad became a sincere Christian. He dumped his alcohol down the toilet, he never drank again, and he was a re really raging alcoholic. Um, I really never saw my dad sit through a Sunday morning service from then on without any tears in his eyes at some point. Uh, he was really converted, and it had an effect on me. But I was on a different path. 
I had seen the Beatles perform on the Ed Sullivan Show, and uh, that was all I needed to know about what I wanted to do in life. Um, I quit going to church pretty early on, started playing guitar, formed my own rock and roll band, and uh, that's what I was doing. I didn't become an atheist. I just didn't think about spiritual things. It wasn't in my mind at all. And um, I became a professional musician. I played in nightclubs um, as I got older. And uh, I did that until I was 21 years old. Then uh, our band broke up and I moved up to Lake Tahoe um, to become a professional gambler. <laughs> Seriously, I was studying card counting and I thought I was gonna make my living as a blackjack player. And I imagined living in Tahoe th uh, four months a year, Monte Carlo four months a year, Las Vegas the other four months. And that's what I was doing when I was 21 years old, playing blackjack, studying card counting. It was during that time I um, learned that my best friend had become a Christian. I heard that. And when I heard it, I remember my first thought was, oh, poor guy, he can't, can't hack reality, has to drift off into fairyland, you know, and believe fantasies and whatnot. I was actually afraid to see him. I was glad that I was living in Tahoe and he was down in Riverside. I was afraid to see him because I thought if I saw him being a close friend that I'd be able to talk him out of his fantasy. And I thought, well, if he wants to be happy, you know, let him be happy. Well, soon I moved back to Riverside because I lost all my money gambling. <laughs> started up my band again, started playing in the nightclub again, and my friend came by to visit me, and he and I began to talk. And stroll up and down Magnolia Avenue in Riverside talking about Christianity. Now, I wanted proof. I wanted evidence that Christianity was true. And he was doing his best to try and give me the things that he knew, but he didn't know a whole lot at that point. But he pointed me to some books, and I began to read the works of great apologists like C.S. Lewis, famous name, and there were others as well. People who were working hard to set forth the, the logical and the historical reasons, evidences for the truth of the Christian faith. I began to read them, and I began to be influenced by it. One day, I went into my bedroom, and I closed the door. I didn't want my family to know what I was doing. And I pulled out that old family Bible, big old family Bible, and I began reading the New Testament. And I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Never read them before. Read through the book of Acts. I read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, becoming the great apostle Paul. And then I began to read his letters, his letter to the Romans, to the Corinthian church, and it was during that time, my, my memory serves me, about the time I was at the book of Galatians or Ephesians, that it, the Spirit of God just spoke to me so powerfully. I was thinking, what I was thinking was, what happened to this man Saul? That at one moment he's breathing out threats and murders against the Christians. He's going into homes, he's dragging people before the Sanhedrin, he's having them put to prison. When Stephen is stoned to death, he's standing there giving his consent. And what happened to change him so radically that I'm reading the book of Galatians and Ephesians and suddenly he's writing to these churches, you know, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are God say grace and peace to you. How I, he's speaking of his love for them and how he prays for them. And it, it, it was the conversion of Paul, really. Uh, through that, God spoke to me and I sat up straight in my bed where I was reading, laying there reading, and I sat up straight, and I just thought, my word, this is true. This stuff is true. Well, about a week later, my dad came to visit. And when he left, I followed, followed him out to the car. And I, I went around to his window, and I said, hey, Dad, could you pick me up for church this Sunday? And I still remember, and he was holding the steering wheel, and he could not even look at me. He just like looked straight ahead, he kind of nodded, and drove away. <laughs> well, he picked me up for church, we went to church, and uh, they were advertising a father-son retreat in the mountains. And so my dad said something, or I said something like, what do you think, you wanna do that? And, and we signed up to go on this father-son retreat. Well, up at the retreat, the pastor of the church spoke to me on the side and found out what was going on with me. And he asked me if I would speak, or not give a sermon. <laughs> he asked me if I would stand up and say something at breakfast, and I told him that I would. 
And so, I, you know, that breakfast morning, I stood up, and I all I remember is I said something about I, I said something about the Buddha. <laughs> I said something about Hinduism, and I said something, and I, and I made the point that none of them, they may have been special people in one way or another, but none of them ever said the things that Jesus said. You know, none of them ever said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but, but through me. I, I remember preaching that, something about that. And I looked over at my dad, who was just face down at the breakfast table, just crying like a baby. That's how my spiritual life really started as a Christian, 22 years old. Well, during that time, I was still playing at the nightclub in Riverside, and that's where I met Tina. She was a waitress. And she came into the nightclub to see the band, and she and I met. One thing led to another. We began to date. We began to talk about Christianity, because I was just learning then. She and I began to go to Bible studies together, and in a sense, she and I became Christians together. Evangelical, non-denominational, Bible Christians going to a Bible study on Wednesday nights and going to a small evangelical Bible church on Sunday mornings. Now, I was on fire right away. I wanted to learn everything that I could about the Christian faith, and so I started buying books, I started reading, I started piling up things, building a library, really. And I knew early on that I wanted to go to Bible college, and I wanted to pursue uh, ordination and Christian ministry in some way. And so, Time transpired, about three years, Tina and I dated, and then we were married, and we were on our way to Michigan, where I was enrolled uh, at Grace Bible College, a small Christian college there, to study for the ministry. That takes us up to college. Okay, now theologically, at that time, I was essentially Baptist. I was what you would call a Reformed Baptist, meaning very Reformation-minded Baptist in my theology. I worked at a Christian bookstore that specialized, in fact, in the works of the Puritans. And I, I became a great lover of the Puritans during that time. I loved Luther and Calvin. You know, they were the great, you know, the, the primary reformers. But my favorite theologian besides them was Jonathan Edwards and many of the British uh, and continental Puritans. Well, what did the Puritans think of Catholicism? You have any idea? It wasn't good. The Puritans were the harshest of all against the Catholic Church. Let me give you an illustration. In one of Jonathan Edwards' books, he's writing about the subject of false humility, and he decides to use the Pope as his illustration of false humility. This is what he says. It seems to be the nature of spiritual pride to make men conceited and ostentatious in their humility. This appears, or this can be illustrated, in that firstborn of pride among the children of men, he who would be called his holiness, even the man of sin, he's, he's, he's using the language of antichrist, even the man of sin, who exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, he styles himself servant of servants, and to make a show of humility, washes the feet of a number of poor men at his inauguration. That's how the Puritans wrote about the Pope. That's how they wrote about the Catholic faith. Did I really believe it then? To be honest, I don't think so. I think as a young man, I just, I just, I loved reading things like that just because they were radical, just because it was so audacious. I didn't really know much at all about the Catholic faith. I knew almost nothing. My anti-Catholicism at that point, it was rooted totally in ignorance. It was real, but it was rooted totally in ignorance. Well, in 1981, I graduated with my degree in Bible and theology. Tina and I moved back to California, where I was enrolled at Fuller Theological Seminary to get a master's degree in theology. I was in love with the study of scripture, the study of theology. I was just pouring myself into these things. And this is when the first thing that happened in my life during this time that I would say began to open me to the thought world of the Catholic faith. And I talked about this in my talks on uh, sola fide, on just justification. So some of you will have heard a little, little of this before. But what happened was this. I had a professor at Fuller Seminary that I had become really close to. In fact, I was his teaching assistant, and um, we talked a lot about the Bible and theology, worked closely together. Well, he was teaching a view of the doctrine of justification at Fuller Theological Seminary that was not exactly Protestant, not exactly kosher, in, the, in Protestant terms. 
As you know, Protestantism insists that we are justified by faith alone. That was Luther's teaching. That was the major uh, doctrinal issue of the Reformation. We are justified by faith alone. Luther said this was the doctrine upon which the church would stand or fall. Calvin described this as the doctrine upon which, the doctrine which is the hinge upon which the door of all true religion swings. And either way you look at it, this was the central issue. And here was this Protestant professor at a Protestant seminary, and one that I looked up to quite a bit, and he was insisting that the biblical pattern that we find in the Bible is never faith alone. He said the pattern that we see in Scripture from the beginning to the end is always faith in God leading to obedience to God, resulting in blessing for those who persevere to the end. If you would enter life, Jesus had said, take up your cross and follow me. It's always faith leading to obedience, resulting in blessing. We have to persevere to the end. As Jesus said, those who persevere to the end will be saved. Well, eventually I came to believe that he was right. This is back in 1981-82. Now, I knew that this made me a strange Protestant. Because I knew that what he was teaching didn't really jive with Luther, Calvin, and the Reformation. But I never contemplated Catholicism. Not even once. I just thought of myself at that time as a Protestant who had a somewhat Catholic view of the doctrine of salvation. Well, in 1983, I finished my master's program at Fuller, and I enrolled in a doctoral program in historical theology at Claremont Graduate School. I was planning to become a professor at a seminary or university or something like that. Um, but of course, Tina and I began to face at that point a problem that everyone faces, or many people face, and that is a little girl was born into the world that you know as Blythe, who's now 31 years old. She was born, we really wanted Tina to be able to take care of her and not have to work. I had been a full-time student. I needed to make money. I was somewhat burned out on academics at that point. And so we made the decision to move back to Riverside, that I would work slowly on my doctoral program at Claremont, but I would get a job, begin to work, and raise our daughter and have a family, get out of the academic world for a while. So I began waiting tables. And I made friends with a young man whose name was John. In fact, we began to go to the same church that John went to. Well, at one point, John invited me to go on a spiritual retreat. And uh, he said, well, let's go on a spiritual retreat. Where are we going to go? And, well, he said, there's this lovely Benedictine monastery in the high desert, a little town called Vallermo, where I like to go. And he says, and he invited me to go along. Well, I had never in my life been to a monastery and I said, okay, let's go. And, you know, as I look back on it now, I don't remember whether I thought on the way out there, what am I doing going to a Catholic monastery? I don't remember that. I was just going along with John, something new. The thing I do remember, though, was really how smitten I was with my experience there at the monastery. The effect that it had on me a place that was so quiet and so peaceful and in many ways so beautiful. I, I, I sat out under this grove of poplar trees that these monks had planted like 40 years ago and I read. We had our meals with the monks. Um, we met Brother Peter, who at that time had just been released from 26 years in imprisonment in China for his Catholic faith. In fact, his, his hand and his arm were permanently deformed from, from being from time spent in solitary confinement in an iron manacle with his, his arm twisted behind his back. And we met him. He didn't seem like the Antichrist, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, it was mainly the worship that struck me. It really did. My first experience. Five times a day, the bells would ring and the monks would stream into that little beautiful rustic chapel to kneel, to pray, to chant the psalms. The sun would not have even risen, and you'd hear those bells ringing, and they're in there, and they're kneeling before God. And there was such an intense sense of reverence that I was, that I was not used to, in the manner in which everything was done, and reverence in the silence, reverence in the bowing, in the way that they would kneel, the way they would genuflect, the way they would read the scripture, the prayers, the chanting, the Gregorian, 
And I remember thinking at the time, these guys even ring the bell as though God is listening and cares. You know, ringing it precisely, perfectly. And again, it's so strange. This was really my first taste of the beauty of Catholicism. And at some deep spiritual level, I would have to say I was smitten. I was smitten. And again, it's strange because I began after that time to visit this monastery whenever I could. It wasn't that often, but I began to visit the monastery, go on spiritual retreats there. And even though I was an egg-headed theologian, really, who spent all my time reading theology and scripture, I don't remember ever asking myself the obvious question. If this is the Church of Antichrist, if this is some radical, wicked distortion of of true Christianity, why am I coming here? <laughs> and why do I love it? And why do I find it it's so beautiful, really? I'm just stupid. The question didn't come to my mind. In that sense, I was just following my heart, and I loved being there. Well, I waited tables for about a year. I wasn't accomplishing much on my doctorate. Finally, I was fed up, and I said to myself, you know what, I gotta get into ministry, I gotta do something practical. And so you know what I did, I'm telling you the truth, I went into my bedroom and I picked up the phone book and I looked in the yellow pages under Baptist churches and my, my finger went down the page and I saw First Baptist Church of Riverside because it was in bold. So if you're ever gonna do any advertising, it is good to put your advertisement in bold. Um, it caught my eye, I called the number and this is literally what I said to the receptionist who answered the phone. It, it, I felt stupid then, and it sounds stupid when I say it now. I said, um, you know, I'm a graduate of Fuller Theological Seminary, and I'm just wondering, who could I call to find out about, I don't know, any, any church who might need someone? <laughs> and she says, just a minute. She, she, she goes off the phone, and then I hear this deep male voice, hello. And it was the senior pastor of the church. And he got on the phone, and I said the same thing that I just said to him. And it, it turns out that he had just decided to start looking for an, an associate youth pastor. And he hadn't even begun his search yet. And he says, you're a graduate of Fuller Seminary. He said, why don't you come on down and let's meet? And I, I, I went down, I brought my guitar, because he wanted to hear me play my guitar. Wanted to hear me sing a worship song real quick. And... Um, Two weeks later, I was hired. I, I was the associate pastor of the First Baptist Church of Montrose. And I, I, I tell you that because as Catholics, that sounds so strange. But that's how it is in the evangelical Bible world. You just hire, you can just hire your pastors. And you, and you can just hire them right off the street. And in, in this case, that's precisely what they did. They just hired a guy who was waiting tables in the area who had a theological degree. And I became his youth pastor. And for three and a half years, I served at the First Baptist Church of Riverside as pastor over junior high, senior high, and college age. And I preached once a month on Sunday nights. Well, during those years, our son Kenny was born. And I was invited then to become senior pastor of a Baptist church in Montrose, California, which is in the area of Glendale. Um, I went out and I candidated for the position, which means interviewed, auditioned preached a sermon, and everyone in the church, this is a congregational church, everyone in the church voted on slips of paper. And they counted the votes and they said, you're hired. And I became the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Montrose, where I served for eight years. Now, during this time, I would say, I began to face, in, in a growing kind of way, another crisis of sorts on the issue of authority. As the senior pastor of an evangelical Baptist church, of course, I began preaching every Sunday morning, which means that I was studying scripture, reading um, the scholarly commentaries on books of scripture all week long. I was also teaching several other times. I began to get pretty deep into study, looking at the Hebrew of the Old Testament, looking at the Greek of the New Testament, consulting scholarly resources, dictionaries, encyclopedias, commentaries, and whatnot, and I found that the more I studied through the years, the less sure I was that I was right. Is salvation something that can be lost? Well, some were arguing yes, some were arguing no. Is the Eucharist more than a symbolic remembering 
of Christ's body and blood? Should infants be baptized? So many other questions. I would listen to popular Protestant ministers preaching. They all disagreed with one another, but each one of them preached with this absolute dogmatic certainty that he was right. I looked at all the different denominations, Protestant denominations, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and so many more, and I found myself wondering, with so many, with, with, with brilliant scholars in each of these denominations, people smarter than me, people holier than me, pastors who prayed more than I did, more intelligent than I am, how can I know that what I'm teaching is true? Why am I a Baptist and not a Lutheran? Why am I not a Methodist? Why am I not a Presbyterian? It was the issue of authority. Now, you all know that whereas the doctrine of justification by faith alone, that, that might have been the central doctrine at the time of the Reformation, the central doctrinal issue, but the main issue that came to play really was the issue of authority. The Catholic Church taught the authority of Scripture, but that was coupled with the authority of a church that Christ had established and to which he had given his spirit so that the church had the authority to preserve the teachings of the apostles and to hand it down and to keep it from error. Well, you know, Protestantism was based on Scripture alone, sola scriptura. And as a Protestant, I'd, I'd always accepted this teaching. I'd been converted to Christ, reading my Bible, laying on the bed. In the evangelical churches I had attended, in Bible college, in seminary, sola scriptura, scripture as the sole infallible rule of faith and practice, was the unspoken assumption that under, underlied everything we did. And if someone had asked me, well, how do you know that your teaching is true and in other denominations is not true? I would have said, well, we look to Scripture, we argue Scripture. And if they said, well, what if you argue Scripture and you still can't agree? Well, we have to argue Scripture more intensely. Well, what if you do it more intensely? What if you pray and study and you still don't agree? There was no other answer. Scripture is our only authority. Well, now I was beginning to wonder, as a pastor, I didn't consciously question Sola Scriptura back then. I didn't contemplate the Catholic position ever, but I found myself just growing more weak over time as a minister, where I felt like I began to focus my teaching just more on spiritual issues and avoiding doctrinal issues, because I realized I, I wasn't sure. Well, then it was in the spring of 1992 that that something happened, really, that changed the course of everything. And so that you understand, in order for you to get the picture, really, and understand this, I have to share something else. These years as pastor at Montrose First Baptist Church were really the happiest years in my family's life. In terms of spiritual growth and ministry, that place was heaven. I mean, these were pretty wise people. They didn't want me working day and night. They wanted me to have plenty of time to study, plenty of time to pray, plenty of time with my family, and they insisted that I take that time. Tina and I, the kids, were happy. I had the privilege of baptizing both my daughter and my son. In terms of our friendships, it was the best. We had good friends there. We loved our time there. And although I wasn't gonna become a millionaire ever, we were secure. I mean, I had a paycheck that showed up in my box every two weeks, and it covered our bills almost, with Tina making some money doing childcare. We were able to buy a little house. We were able to go on vacations. They gave me a month off every year, paid vacation where the associate pastor would take over and do everything. So we, we, we hopped in our van and we drove around the country. We visited historical sites. We had great times. I mean, it was heaven, really, and I had security there. I could have stayed there the rest of my life. Um, there was no issue. And then, this gentleman in my congregation, I'm not sure why I call him a gentleman, actually, thinking about it, he comes to me on a Sunday night, and he had been arguing with this organization called Catholic Answers down in San Diego. And he says to me, Pastor Ken, they've sent me all, this, all, all, the, all these written materials, some of it's over my head, and they sent me a set of tapes by some guy named Scott Hahn. It's called Answering Common Objections Against the Catholic Faith. He said, I, I wonder, would you read this stuff and would you list these tapes and, and, and show me where the Catholics are wrong? Well, 
Actually, he, he just mentioned the written materials first. And I said, sure, let me read them, no problem. Then he said, and I got this set of tapes. Well, when he said I got this set of tapes, my jaw hit the floor, because Scott Hahn was someone who had been a friend of mine back in seminary. It's a long story, which I won't tell now, but basically, he and I had become friends. He and I had spent some time talking about the Bible and theology together. We'd actually become pretty close friends in a short amount of time. I knew who Scott Hahn was. He ended up going back to the East Coast, and over time, he and I drifted apart, and we hadn't spoken in years. But I knew Scott to be a very, very sharp guy. He was someone I really respected. And when that guy said, I've got these tapes by a guy named Scott Hahn answering common objections against the Catholic faith, I said, where are those tapes? <laughs> and he said, don't worry. He said, they're at home, I'll bring them next week. I said, I said no, where do you live? <laughs> I, I, I did, I said, literally, I said, I'm following you to your house now. He was probably wondering, what's the big deal? You know, but I followed him to his house, he went inside, he got the tapes. He brought them out, he gave them to me, and I still remember standing out there under the street lamp, looking down at the set of tapes, looking at them, and going, oh my word, this is Scott Hahn. I got in my car, I must have drove 100 miles an hour home. Just out of sheer curiosity, I went into the living room, I went over to the corner, I sat down in the rocking chair, I put on my headphones because I did not want Tina to know what I was listening to, and I listened to his, the first tape, Protestant minister becomes Catholic, his conversion story. And I can only say I was a little more than curious. I didn't know it then, but looking back, I could see that for 12 years before, God had been preparing me for what I was going to listen to that night. I listened to Scott talk, for instance, in this tape, about his love for Martin Luther and his great love for the Reformers, and how he had come since to reject the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone. I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, well, hadn't I, all the way back at seminary, hadn't I come to a, a view that was very close to the Catholic view then? But I had never thought of it as the Catholic view. And for years as a pastor, I had been teaching my congregation that they, you have to, it, it's all the grace of God. But by the grace of God, you have to trust God you have to listen to what he says, and you have to live in obedience to him and persevere in that to the end. And of course, there's mercy to be forgiven every time you fall, but that's the pattern. I've been teaching that, and I'm listening to Scott now, and suddenly it's hitting me. Have I been teaching Catholicism? I listen to Scott go on and talk about the beauty of the Catholic liturgy. liturgy. And he insisted that this had been the historic Christian worship, that, that's, that Catholic worship was simply historic Christian worship. I'm listening to this, and again I'm thinking about St. Andrew's Abbey, the Benedictine Monastery. I had, throughout my years as a pastor, continued to go there from time to time because there was a sense of awe in that place. There was a sense of reverence and the holiness of God Holiness and worship that I did not experience in my evangelical context. There was something about Catholic worship that was so much richer. It was something that spoke to my mind, it spoke to my spirit, but it spoke to my mind and my spirit through the avenue of everything I was created in the image of God. Through my eyes, through my ears, through my knees, and with the incense, even through, through your nose. God speaking to you in every way. The entirety of who we are is the image of God. And you know, through the years as a Baptist minister, I had become more and more interested in the spiritual disciplines. And I had read books written by Protestants, books like The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, or The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. These are Protestants writing about the spiritual disciplines. And I had noticed that in these books that they virtually quote, I mean, they quote almost, uh, what's the right word? I'm, you know, they quote extensively and only from Catholic sources. You find them quoting St. John of the Cross, St. Catherine of Siena. It's always St. this, it's St. that. And again, I noticed this, that they were, it was, everything was rooted back in Catholicism, but it didn't strike me. It didn't hit me. I had even begun to read some of the great Catholic devotional classics, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Aquinas. 
I had a copy of Brother Lawrence's Practice of the Presence of God, which I read. That's Tina's favorite book. She's read it a million times. And I love those books. I would just skip over the parts whenever they mentioned the Eucharist or Mary or something like that. It's just sort of like reading along going, this is so great, this is so great, oops, you know, this is so great, oops, just jump right over it. But increasingly, through the years, there was a flavor to my own spirituality that was being touched by my experience with Catholicism. And from time to time, I would even have members in my congregation, you know, come to me and say, you're, you're this strange kind of Protestant monk in the, you know, in, in the way that I pastored, in the way that I came off in the church. And yet, through all these years, I never contemplated the idea that Catholicism might be authentic Christianity. Never. And then I'm listening to Scott, and he's talking about how one of his students in seminary had asked him one day, had said, Professor Hahn, where does the Bible actually teach that the Bible is to function alone as the sole rule of faith and practice for Christians? It's a question that was asked him. Where does the Bible actually teach that? And Scott goes on to talk about how that just ran him right off the rails. That question, when he began to think about it, he realized he couldn't think of any place where the Bible actually taught that. It was an assumption. It was the ground floor rules of, of the Protestant worldview. It wasn't something you could find a verse teaching. Well, I listened to that, and I thought about my own experience again. Through the years, I had begun to crave an answer to the issue of certainty. How do we know? Scott was saying that along with an inspired scripture, great gift to the church, that God had given his people also a spirit-inspired church, given his spirit to that church so that it could lead and preserve and hand down the truth. Well, I had been craving an answer to this issue of certainty. I had also begun to crave an answer to the issue of division in the church. Jesus had prayed, Father, make them one so that the world will know that you had sent me. But how could we ever be one if it was every man and his private interpretation of the Bible? And here was Scott suggesting maybe God had never intended it to be every man and his private interpretation of the Bible. Maybe God had provided something more than that. I'm listening to all this, and I'm thinking all of this, Tina walks in. So what's Scott saying? <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> oh, or just, oh, Scott, Scott became a Catholic. How strange. Something like that. I shut down the conversation as quickly as I could. Next morning, I drove 100 miles an hour back to my church. I called Scott on the phone. I looked him up. Franciscan University in Steubenville. I got him on the phone, and I, we hadn't talked in uh, 10 years, and I said, Scott, um, this is Ken Hensley. I just found out that you became a Catholic. What in the world? And Scott, there were many, many words, but Scott essentially said, Ken, I, I, I don't even know where to start. So much has happened. He said, but if I were to send you more tapes to listen to, would you listen to them? And I said, yes. So we got off the phone, and I've talked, some of you have heard this now, but... Um, a couple of days go by, he called St. Joseph Communications, and apparently he said, I've got a Baptist minister on the hook, and um, help me reel him in, <laughs> something like that, because a few days later, a box showed up at my church, at my Baptist church, a big box, it wasn't the size of this podium, but almost, and stamped all over the outside, St. Joseph Communications, St. Joseph Communications, St. Joseph Communications. I pulled the box into my, you know, thank, thankful that my associate pastor came late. Um, I pulled it into my office, I locked the door, and I opened that up, and there were, there were tapes and CDs in there on, you know, on the Book of Romans, on this, on that, on the sacraments, on, on all kinds of subjects. Well, at first I was skeptical. I began to debate Scott on the phone and a little bit by email then at that time. But I remember pretty quickly beginning to realize that I just had a lot to learn. I was stunned that I had graduated from Bible college and graduated from seminary and was in a doctoral program and I knew so little about the Catholic faith. 
I had never read a book about Catholicism written by a Catholic. I had only read books against Catholicism written by an, rather anti-Catholic Protestants. And so at, at a certain point, I basically said to Scott, I said, Scott, send me a list of the 20 most important books that you would give me. And um, he did. And, and, and I went on my way, and we really didn't talk for the next three years. I began to read, though. I began to read everything I could get my hands on. I began to listen to every taped debate I could find between Protestants and Catholics. I really went to town, listening to them four or five times, almost memorizing these debates, asking the question, could the Catholic Church really be the historic Christian Church? Could the Catholic Church really be my spiritual home? Now, Tina is sharp. And when I began to come home every evening with stacks of books in my arms, books with titles such as the documents of Vatican II, <laughs> the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, the fundamentals of Catholic dogma, the emergence of the Catholic tradition, and you'll love this one, Evangelical is Not Enough by Thomas Howard. That was a good book. She knew that something was going on. <laughs> and so funny, I can laugh at it now. 17 years later, 18, 19 years later, I can laugh. One day she looked at me, and I remember, and she, she just said right out, she goes, why are you reading all those books about Catholicism? You don't think they might be true, do you? Now, <laughs> cut for a second. Why was I reading them? Did I think they might be true? Honesty? I think I was beginning to suspect that they might be true. I was beginning to suspect that there was something there. But I had a lot of reasons for not wanting to become Catholic. And I knew that Tina had no desire whatsoever to even contemplate Catholicism. And so I, I'm sure I responded to her as a courageous man of God would. And I said, no, I don't think they're, I don't think they're true. I'm just reading out of curiosity. No, some, something dumb like that. I think that I said, no, I don't think that Catholicism is true. Don't worry, honey. It's just that I'm curious now, and, and I want to read, and I want to learn, and I want to understand precisely how wrong they are, something like that. <laughs> well, I kept reading. The problem is, the more I read and the more I listened, the more sense the whole thing began to make to me. There, of course, was the issue of Scripture. Being a Protestant, being a Bible Christian, primary in my thinking was whether Catholic teachings would be confirmed by Scripture. And there's no time in a story to, to go into the details except to say that on issue after issue, baptism, baptismal regeneration, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the primacy of Peter, the communion of saints, even purgatory, I found that the teachings of the Catholic Church fit beautifully with what the Bible actually says. In fact, again and again, there were passages of Scripture that had been positively opaque to me, and yet viewed through the lens of Catholic teaching and tradition, they were illuminated. They made sense. They came alive. And then there was the issue of history, which I've gone into quite a bit in the series that I've been teaching. The Catholic writers that I was, that I was reading, they kept insisting that Jesus founded the Catholic Church, and if you would only read the early fathers of the church, you would be able to see that they were Catholic, not Protestant. As I've mentioned before, I read John Henry Newman, who said famously, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. He said it was easy to show that the Christianity of history was not the Christianity of Luther and Calvin and the Baptists and Protestantism since. So I decided to read the early fathers firsthand. I didn't want to read them at first through the lens of, a, of any historian. I wanted to read their own words, and so I picked up with the post-apostolic writings Clement, Ignatius, Justin, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and I began to read them straight through. And as you've seen in the lessons the last few weeks, what did I find? Well, I, I found them talking about baptism in ways I would have never spoken, never even dreamed to speak as a Baptist. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true, and undertake to live accordingly, are instructed to pray and to entreat God with fasting for the remission of their sins that are past. We pray and fast with them. Then they are brought by us where there is water and they are regenerated. Then they are brought by us where there is water 
and they are born again. They are regenerated in the same manner in which we ourselves were regenerated. For in the name of God the Father and of our Savior Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, they, are, they then receive the washing with water. As Christ said, unless you are born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Justin Martyr, A.D. 150. I found them talking about the Eucharist and Christ's presence in the Eucharist, again, and saying things that I would have never dreamed to say as a Protestant Baptist minister. For instance, we call this food Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true and who has been washed in the washing which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration, and is thereby living as Christ enjoined. For not as common bread, nor as common drink do we receive these. But since Jesus Christ, our Savior, was made incarnate by the Word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too, as we have been taught, the food which, we have, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by Him is both the flesh and blood of that incarnate Jesus. Everywhere I turned in the Church Fathers, I found them talking about the Catholic Church. I found them talking about altars in the Church, talking about the Eucharist as a sacrifice, talking about priests and bishops, talking about the Church of Rome. I read on and on, and I, I just could not get away from the fact that the early church reminded me of my experiences up at the Benedictine Monastery. There was a fit between the ancient church and what I experienced at the monastery. It looked Catholic, that is the early church. It sounded Catholic. To my detective's nose, it smelled Catholic. The early fathers smelled Catholic. The early church smelled Catholic. I remember coming home one day, I looked at Tina and I said, honey, I've been wandering around in the early church for months now. I've looked under every rock, I've looked behind every tree, and there ain't a Baptist in sight. I can't find anyone in the early church that looks like we look in terms of our beliefs and our practice as evangelical Baptists. Now I can look back and laugh now, like I said, but it was really excruciating at the time. I gotta tell you, for the first two years of my study of Catholicism, Tina and I could not even talk about the subject without it winding up in tears. An argument it was very serious. She had no interest in looking at Catholicism. I might as well have come home one day, a Baptist pastor supporting her and supporting our family with my income. I might as well have come home someday and said, you know, I, maybe the atheists are right. She had no interest in exploring Catholicism. And on the other side of the coin, she loved the Christianity that we were used to. She loved First Baptist Montrose. She had good friends there. We had a good life there. She had no interest in even contemplating Catholicism. So it, so it, it was a terribly hard time for a while. One day I remember Tina said to me, she said, why can't you just stop? She said, why, why can't you just close those books and just stop? You know, you have a wonderful life now. You have a church, you have people you can minister to. And I remember saying, you know, feeling apologetic about it and just saying, basically saying, honey, I didn't imagine when I began to read, I didn't imagine that I would actually begin to believe what I was reading. And then by the time I was beginning to believe what I was reading, then what am I gonna do? Am I gonna like, close the books and pretend like I haven't read what I've read? And she'd say, I know, I know. But the Catholic faith? That, that's what it was like. I don't want to be a Catholic. And this is how it went on for a long time. And I had a hard time being a pastor, too, going through this, because I didn't want to tell my congregation what I was thinking. Because after all, maybe I was just mentally ill. Maybe I, maybe I was suffering from temporary insanity, and as I read through the material, I would come to see that the Baptist faith was true and right, and I would be even more secure. So I didn't want to disrupt the church. And so I was keeping it all inside. There was one friend at the church who I suspected, I guess, would be open, and I talked to him about it on the side. He and his family became Catholic, too. But I didn't tell anybody else. 
Besides that, it was people that I got to know. Jimmy Aiken, an apologist with Catholic Answers, he became a good friend during that time. Jimmy would drive up to Long Beach, I would drive down, we'd meet for lunch, and I'd hit him with all the hardest questions I could think about. What about the evil popes? What about the Borgia popes? What about Alexander VI? What about Pope Honorius, the heretic? How do you reconcile this with the notion of papal infallibility? I would hit Jimmy with all these questions, and I've always thought of him as sort of a white walking encyclopedia of Catholic apologetics. I referred to him at the time as the Terminator. Remember that movie, The Terminator? <laughs> the Terminator of Catholic apologetics, or robo-apologist, something like that. I had several, several names for him. Because I would hit Jimmy with just the hardest question, and he would sit there at the table and he'd go, well, there are four ways to approach this. First the philosophical, then the historical, then the biblical, and he would give me a great answer. Well, Tina and I began to talk seriously over time when she realized where it was going. And at having talked to me, she was beginning to soften up through the years. Three and a half years had gone by from the time when I began to think about this. What are we going to do? Tina wanted to know. I said, I think I need to resign my ministry. I don't think I can be a pastor anymore. She said, but are you sure? <laughs> are you 100% sure? And I said, well, no, but I'm pretty sure. And she goes, but how can you resign? How can you leave everything if you're not sure? She said, please, we talk together and we agree. Let's give it one more year. You study, you pray, we'll continue to talk. And a year from now, if you are sure, then we resign and we leave. It was August of 1995. Three and a half years had gone by since I first listened to Scott's tape. I agreed with Tina and she went and drew up a contract and asked me to sign it. Well, a year passed by, nothing changed. My, my, my convictions were getting deeper, and the truth be told, during that year, hers were beginning to catch too, her conviction too. She was learning a lot through osmosis. The time drew near, and the, the reality is, I knew I needed to resign my ministry, and I was scared to death. So I went up to the Benedictine Monastery again, out in Vallermo, to pray and to ask God to give me the strength, really, you know, to do something that I didn't want to do. I was excited. I mean, at that point, I wanted to become Catholic, but I was scared to death. I had prepared my entire adult life for the Christian ministry. I knew I couldn't remain a Baptist minister, but I didn't want to leave that church. I, I did not want to leave my people there. Um, I certainly didn't want to walk out into the world in my mid-40s um, and start over, banging on doors and trying to figure out a new way to make money. I didn't want to do it. And then there was the issue of my dad. From the time my dad had come back to Christ, if he could have, he would have wanted to become a Baptist minister. And he probably could have in terms of his talent. I think he, he could have done it. But the thing is, no matter how much you want to become an ordained minister, it's pretty tough to get around being married five times. <laughs> so he kind of knew that that was not in the cards for him. But because of that, the pride and joy of his life was my becoming ordained and becoming a pastor. He would come and listen to me preach. And he'd sit there in the pew, you know, it's puffed up with pride and listened to me preach. I had no desire on earth to hurt that man. And because the only thing he'd ever known his entire life was a very fundamentalist Baptist faith, he was very anti-Catholic. He had been taught that the Catholic Church was a wicked, evil perversion of pure Christianity. And that's what he thought. Well, I went out to St. Andrew's Abbey, and I prayed, and I asked God, and um, I called Tina from up there to say hi, and she told me, she said, I've got to tell you something, we just got diagnosis today, your dad's been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. 
and, um, and it's pretty far along. We knew he had been weak. We knew something was happening. And he was losing strength very quickly, but we, we didn't know what it was. And Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease is terminal. There's no answer for it. Um, it's called motor neuron disease. You basically lose the connection between your brain and your muscles. And uh, pretty soon you can't walk, then you can't sit, then you're laying in a bed, and in the end your lungs can't, uh, the muscles can't support your breathing and you die. And um, when I heard that, you know, I, I truly did not know how to interpret this in terms of the providence of God. I thought to myself, I can't tell him now. Maybe God doesn't want me to do it. Maybe I'm supposed to wait. Maybe I'm supposed to just try and stick it out for a while more or something like that. Well, the more I thought about it, I talked to Tina, I prayed, I realized I could not stay any longer. And so I made the decision at that time, I spoke to a couple of priests about it too, to resign my ministry, and if at all possible, to not tell my father, and to let him die in peace. So, a couple of weeks later, in August of 1996, I, told, I called the deacon board of the church together, and uh, trembling, I sat down on my stool there, down in the, the room where we met, and I said, I, I have to tell you something, I'm not gonna be able to remain here as, as your pastor. I've been in a deep theological, struggle for a couple of years now, and I'm on my way into the Catholic Church. Said it just like that. I couldn't figure out any, any more, fin I couldn't finesse it. Well, it, it was like a bomb fell in that room. It's just shock. People crying. Someone called the denominational leaders. I got a call. We want to meet with you tomorrow night in your office. We met in my office. The Next night, Monday night, with six or seven leaders from the denomination, they asked me, what are you doing? I'm, I'm becoming Catholic. Um, and they, they basically said, do you want one week to say goodbye or two weeks to say goodbye to the church? And I was out. So I preached my last sermons. I was out. Um, and it was a difficult situation. There were some hard times to follow. Um, dealing with so many friends, um, fellow pastors who thought that I'd lost my mind, a couple of them who thought I'd been just taken away by Satan himself, um, dealing with the effects on my family, had so many people who wanted to debate with me and argue with me, right at a point when I needed to be looking for a job. <laughs> um, there were some really rough times, and I, I guess almost symbolic of it when it really hit home, because I finally got a job waiting tables again. <laughs> and um, I was in my 40s now, and I got a job waiting tables. And as a pastor, of course, and as an illustrious senior pastor, you know, I had always been at home on Christmas Eve with my family, around the tree, having fun, you know, with friends and family and whatnot. Well, the Christmas Eve of 1996 really brought home to me what I had done when, when, when Tina and Blythe and Kenny came down to the restaurant where I was waiting tables to have their Christmas Eve dinner so that I could wait on them. And uh, there were some funny things along that time too, some kind of funny and humiliating sense. I was standing in the kitchen of the restaurant. My manager told me to fold napkins. And I, I remember I was standing there folding napkins and I was thinking about Martin Luther. I was thinking about some issues regarding the Reformation. When she walked in, she's a do dozen years younger than me, she walked into the kitchen and started screaming at me to fold napkins faster, <laughs> to fold my napkins faster. And that was a moment in which I just kind of thought, oh man, what have I done? What have I done? At the same time, obviously, it was good. Tina and I began to talk more we came to St. Charles Borromeo Parish in North Hollywood where a young priest there befriended us, took us under his wing. Tina and I went through RCIA together and at the Easter Vigil service of 1997, we were together received into the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And I remember very distinctly uh, standing there that night um, 
And when the old Monsignor Keeper, that was his name, the, the, the pastor of that church, when he came up and he traced the sign of the cross on my forehead with oil and said, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I received my first communion, it, it was really, sincerely, one of the most profoundly happy moments of my entire life. And it was, it, it was worth it all. It was worth it all. And as I said, when I look at my family now and the direction things have gone, when I look at Blythe and Kirby and I look at the grandchildren and all, when I look at you, when I look at this parish now, it was worth it all. Um, so in closing, I just want to encourage you with a passage. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, in his joy, he went and sold all that he had to buy that field. Those, those of you that have been born and raised into the Catholic faith, I just want to say to you, you know, give thanks to God. It really is a precious gift that you've been given from birth, and don't allow yourself to take it for granted. If you don't understand your faith, you know, learn. It's so enriching to learn more and more and to have the picture filled in and become bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper and more and more rich. If you need some tapes, I've got a lot of them. <laughs> um, no one has a tape player anymore, but I've got a ton of cassette tapes. <laughs> and then finally, if you haven't been living your faith as well as you should, you know what to do. Each one of us, every day, I do the same thing. You get up each day and say, start again. Line up along that wall. <laughs> start again. And I'll close with that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. selection process is very difficult and Tina was actually uh, was actually baptized Catholic as an infant her mother and her father were sort of nominally Catholic and then and, and they went to mass occasionally but then they became angry because they wanted her to go to Catholic school and they couldn't afford it and somehow the school didn't pitch in so they became angry and just quit going so she was raised nominally Catholic, but really nothing after, you know, after four or five or six years old, seven years old. Um, she has an aunt, though, who's a, who's a nun, lives in a convent in, in Canada, and uh, her name's Victoria, and uh, Tina got her middle name from her. She was named after her. And uh, she was around writing letters to Tina once in a while. When Tina's father died, she, he, he died when she was very young, 17. Um, she got a beautiful note from her, from her aunt, Victoria, the nun, and if she's in her habit, it's very severe, you know, but I've got, we got a great photo of her at home, um, in which she, she wrote some encouraging words to Tina, so, 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 so Tina had a little bit of background, she says that her father always believed in God, her father and her mother would never deny God, but they just didn't practice, you know, that, that was her background. Yes. Do you still have uh, acquaintances with uh, your other friends? From do I still have like acquaintances from back then? Yes, I do. Um, you know, uh, you know, life is you move on and you meet new people, and, and it's, it's hard to keep up all old contacts. But no, we have a, a couple of families ended up becoming Catholic with us along the way, and there are a couple more. Um, there are people who live in Michigan. One of them just became Catholic a, month, a couple months ago at Easter Vigil. I've been talking to him for years. He was a friend back then. There's another family in Michigan uh, who I think would be Catholic right now if, if they weren't so involved in ministry in their church and they just can't think about it. You know, they can't think about it. Which reminds me of a, one, one, one of my fellow pastors. Um, during the time that I was studying, you, you know I said that I was keeping it secret, kind of. I was keeping it to myself. I didn't want my church to know. Well, there were a couple of funny events that happened because while I was deep in my study, I went to a, a, a guy's house in my church one day 
And all of a sudden he looks at me and he goes, what do you think of Catholicism? And you know, I, my heart almost stopped. I thought, who told you, you know? <laughs> and that's what I thought. <laughs> but, but it wasn't that, he was just asking an innocent question. And then later on, I was up at camp one time and one of my fellow pastors in the same Baptist denomination asked me to go to lunch with him. And we're sitting there across the table at lunch and he goes, what do you think of Catholicism? And again, you know, we thought, oh, you know, heart attack, you know, like, who's been talking behind my back? Where, you know, and the story was, he's, he had been from Connecticut, and he said out there, there was some young priest had been coming around and befriending him, and he said, this young priest was really nice and really smart, and, he, and he's like basically started evangelizing me toward the Catholic faith, and he said, a lot of his arguments I found really compelling, but then he said, we moved you know, from Connecticut, and we're out here in California now, and he was pastoring a big church in Orange County. And for some reason, he wanted to know what I thought of Catholicism. Well, that opened the door, and I, I was pretty far along in my thinking at that point, and so that opened the door and I spilled the beans. You know, I, I told him everything I was thinking. And we talked for about two hours. And at the end of it, we were back at the camp, sitting in the car, and I remember he said to me, he said, these things you've been saying today, he goes, you are really hitting, hitting me below the belt, as they say. He said, but I'm not going to do anything about this. He said, I have a great church, and I have a great ministry, and I love my life, and I'm not going to go down this corridor. And that was the last time I ever, I ever talked to him. Um, but there, there are some other younger guys that, yeah, I have, so I still have friendships, but it's just here and there. Your life is a beautiful story. Oh, thank you. And I'm very thankful. Any questions from the Staley's? <laughs> <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> All right. Oh, yes. Carmen. Have you thought about becoming a deacon? Um, the question is, if I've ever thought of becoming a deacon, that's something Mr. Staley always asks me. <laughs> and the answer so far is no. And the thing is, it's partly because ever since leaving the um, ministry, I had to go out and find a way to work. And I've been, I was a full-time working guy and a father and all that. And then, I can't say that now, I don't have kids in my home now. But still working full time, having all the grandchildren and all that. Plus, I, I, I feel like my real um, love is uh, teaching and um, speaking. And I speak at conferences and things too. I don't know if you know about that. You know, I, I speak at apologetics conferences and all. And so whenever I think about it, I, I, I always just think, okay, you become a deacon. You go through like five, six years of training. And then you have a lot of responsibilities and then the responsibilities are not exactly all of them the ones that are up my line of gifting you know so no I haven't thought of that not really yes there's a, a new job that might open at the youth ministry where oh <laughs> she says a new job might open as a youth minister here she wants to know if I want to go back to being a youth pastor I don't know <laughs> anyway Oh, okay. Yes? You speak about a son. Is that a son? Did he come into the Catholic Church too? Yeah, yeah, our son was younger and he came into the church with Tina and I. Um, Blythe was a little too old. That, that, was, that was a tough one. We ended up making the decision to let her do what she wanted to do. And she continued at the Evangelical Baptist Church, you know. And we just talked. And on the side, oh, over time, she was converted to the faith. Um, our son was young, and he came into the church with us, and he went to Catholic school and all, but he's not practicing now. Um, he, he believes in the Catholic faith, and, he would, and he would, he'll jump to the defense of the Catholic faith, but he's not living a life now where he's, he's going to Mass and on, a reg on a regular basis. When he comes down here, he lives in Seattle. He's a, he's a musician, and so he lives in a world of secular musicians, and he travels all over the country performing, all over the world really, performing with them. And so he's the only one there 
who has strong Christian convictions, and I think he's, 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 he's on the shy side, so I think he's just kind of quiet and he keeps it to himself. We talk about things when he's here. He comes to Mass with us when he's here, and, he, and he's gone to Mass a few times on his own up there, but he's just not practicing now. Pray for him. His name's Kenny. I'm very creative. <laughs> you see how creative I am? Oh, yeah, Paul. Okay, la last question, then I'll dismiss you, so anybody who wants to leave can feel comfortable doing that. I'll stick around. Uh, I was just wondering, do you have other family members, brothers and sisters, that are still Baptists? And yeah, he's wondering my church? other family members that are still Baptists. Oh, my, my family situation is a is a st strange deal. Um, my stepmother and my father, they were married almost all my life. Because after he came back to Christ, they, they had been living together. For, and he, they got married. And he was married to her until he died. And she treated us like her own children. But then after my dad died, and after we all became Catholic, she just like went away. So um, we haven't heard from her now. You know, we're, we're completely disconnected from her. Um, my, my sister, Roxanne, is an evangelical Christian. She's an odd one, Roxanne. She's an evangelical Christian. She goes to a Baptist church on Sunday mornings because she has her friends and all that. And every time she talks to me, she admits that the arguments I'm making are really strong. And she even starts to sound like she's arguing for the Catholic faith, but she just doesn't do anything. She goes back and she just keeps going to her Baptist church with her friends. Um, my brother it, it, it is another one. My brother drifted off and um, he, he, be, he became an architect and uh, I don't see him very often. And um, so we almost never talk about spiritual things and I don't really know where he's at. That's a terrible one. Ken, I, I got a little comment to make. Um, um, yeah. On behalf of everybody here, uh, we've got a little card that we'd like to present to you. Is that what you were passing around? Yeah. <laughs> I was saying, what are you guys doing? Signing up for a <laughs> signing up for a raffle or something? I don't know if I was going to get it. Oh, oh, thank you. It's a thank you card from everybody. Thank you, thank you, card. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll enjoy reading that. So <laughs> that's what was happening here. Okay, listen. Um, Again, I'm going to talk to Father Art when he gets back, and I really want to do a series on church history and more on the Reformation, all kinds of things. So thanks a lot for coming. It's been great this, these times, and goodbye.